here. We got a different episode for you. I'm so excited. So excited because someone reached out and said, can I share something with you? And I love it when people share. And did they want anything in return? Absolutely not. Which is right up there on the scale of magnificent. So you're going to have to listen, but it's, we've had someone come and they're doing a lovely presentation to us and it is so wonderful. Anyway, enough of that. You've got to listen and then you'll learn right after this. Hey, this is the Personal Development Unplugged podcast where we use hypnosis. Yeah, hypnosis. NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Don't worry what it is. It's just a mass of processes that we're going to get you to change. Change to let go of anxiety, low self-esteem, and create massive, massive supreme inner confidence. But that's confidence in your competence and competence in your confidence, which means you can do anything and be, well, be safe to enjoy. Enjoy the world as it should be with you at the helm, creating the life that you want. That's what this podcast is about. You and being the best you you could be, singing from your real voice, aligned with your mission, aligned with your passions. That's what it's about. So if you're interested in letting go of anxiety, if you're interested in letting go of fear, guilt, all those blooming syndromes, imposter syndromes, and every little bit of the mind which is negative, then have a listen here because we've got some wonderful processes and lots of good conversations with between you and me to get us both thinking in such wonderful ways. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Just take the trance to have a have a listen. Help! Help me! Help me, please! If you want to help yourself, be yourself, and grow, then look no further, because you're here. Personal Development Unplugged. Warning. 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 You are entering into the unplugged mind of Paul Clough. Clough. Too late. Personal Development Unplugged. Hey, my friend, how you doing? We have a special episode. It's, yeah, it's so nice, so nice, and I'm going to explain it in a minute. Because, you see, we have so many people who request to be a guest on this show. And I always say, yeah, if you've got the content, you're more than welcome. And I do talk about people, how oh, in my early days, that people who, like, they're wannabes. And they have the talk. And they can talk the talk. But unfortunately, when it comes to doing things... They don't necessarily, well, the walk is lacking. And so I invite these people, or they invite themselves in, in, in effect, and I say, yeah, please, come and do a recording. Oh, yeah, please, please, yeah, we'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. And then it's like silence. And I might even say, oh, how are you getting on? Silence. And that's such a shame, isn't it? Such a shame when there are so many good people around, and that's the whole point. And that's a, a little bit of credit to us, I think, that people actually want to come on the show. Okay. But we have someone who wants, wanted to come on the show. And I said, you know, you're not going to waste my time, are you? And he was so positive. So positive about he could bring something to the table, to walk the walk and really bring something to you. And I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased. Because I can tell you who it is yet. I am so pleased because this one person did what they said, which is a testament to their own personal development as well, their own uh, values, their own beliefs, which is what we talk about here in Personal Development Unplugged, isn't it? It is, you know, being the best you can, striving to be your best you can, living up to your highest values, finding the most empowering beliefs and live by them, and doing your best for others. For no want in return. And this is what we've got here today. And I think what you'll see is 
although there's a slightly different way of looking at things, we come from the same philosophic, not, is it a philosophical background, but, you know, from the same core beliefs. Things that, you know, how to improve yourself and how good it is to improve yourself, where there's nothing in failure, because there is no thing as failure. You'll, you'll hear things like that, uh, because your failure is your feedback. Someone actually said that if they could only take one thing with them, it would be their failures, because that's where they found their most valuable learnings. And I don't really get that as much as I don't like it failures, because they're just different. It's a different result that you expected. But it gives you so many learnings and something to, to really change the way you want to be, because it gives you something to have. And, and that makes you empowered. You'll, you'll hear that too. Empowerment and being at cause. And that being at cause, you'll, you'll hear things like, because you have decided to take action. You chose to take action. And you can choose to take action in special ways. And again, you know, if you think about it, the first two keys of success we talk about here so often is the one, know your goal, and then take inspired, massive, and continuous action. And you'll also, it's really interesting because um, this guy comes from a different background and he's moving in such a way in the whole now personal development um, genre, as it were, and coming from transferring skills from different contexts and then using those skills into different contexts, which is what we do here. But it is, you have got so many skills that we just sometimes forget, I think, to use them in, in different ways. You know, and, and I work with clients and, and I, hopefully I, I can impart it with you that if you have confidence in one thing, then let's take that confidence and put it as a skill in another area of your life. Because in that first one where you're confident, you're safe. Because you're not overconfident, but you're confident, you're learning, and you're doing a great job. You're, you're probably in the flow, in the moment. In the moment. Which again, you'll hear about that as well. And when you take that into others, it, to other areas of your life, your unconscious mind goes, yeah, because we were safe over there, and that's what I want to do for you. And it's this, I think, striving for continued improvement. You'll hear things like that. Maybe not in the direct, direct words that I've just said them, but you'll get the same feeling. And one of the things this guy says is creating your A game. Creating your A game by bringing the fundamentals, the fundamentals, again, from transferring of skills. And I see that as being striving to be your best and continued never-ending improvement in yourself to be the best and then, a, then some. And you see those fundamentals, it's, isn't it just doing what works? Not making things overcomplicated? And where we go is, in simplicity, there's genius. It all just wraps itself around each other. So I'm so pleased when I listened to the bit I want to play you now, how close we were and how impressed I am with this. I'll tell you who it is. Alan Stein Jr. He's awesome. Absolutely awesome. You are going to be enwrapped with this. Take notes because you'll be seeing your own personal development or personal development um, from a different perspective. But it's looking at the same thing from a different pair of eyes, which means then we get to see things richer. Because you know, when you look at things differently, they appear different. But it's a richer experience you're going to get now, from which then you can choose. Choose to find those fundamental skills. Transfer them. Bring your A game. Create your A game. Strive to be the very best you can. You are going to enjoy this immensely. That is a cluffy guarantee. So now I'm going to let Alan, and I'm so pleased and so grateful that he reached out to us. I'll let Alan introduce himself. And, well, the floor is yours, Alan. Go for it. Hi, my name is Alan Stein Jr. and I'm a keynote speaker, performance coach, and the author of two books, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, and Sustain Your Game, High Performance Keys to Manage Stress, Avoid Stagnation, and Beat Burnout. 
I'm honored to be here on Personal Development Unplugged. I'm going to share a few thoughts on sustaining excellence and enjoying the process, on maximizing performance and managing stress, and on heightening focus. I hope you find my perspective helpful. Though it's been years since I've worked directly with athletes, I still consider myself a coach. And although my primary area of focus is no longer in sports, I still teach the principles, lessons, and strategies that I learned on the field and court. Sports are elemental. They're about performing in pressure moments, managing your emotions through adversity, communicating with others toward a collective goal, and staying disciplined when others don't. I think of these as fundamentals. And no matter your domain, your ability to do them will distinguish you from everyone else, even those who may have more opportunity, natural talent, or intelligence. I've never felt that what you have is most important, but rather what you do with what you have, that's what matters most. The highest performers in all walks of life have taken full ownership of themselves, their work, and their choices. They got to where they are, and they have stayed there because they've chosen to establish, refine, and repeat the mindset and habits that serve them best. These men and women understand that you can't be selective when it comes to excellence. After all, how we do anything is how we do everything. I've worked with the likes of NBA stars Kevin Durant and Victor Oladipo when they were young and watched superstars like Kobe Bryant and Steph Curry in their private routines. I've sat across from Mark Cuban and Jesse Itzler as they talked about how they built their empires, and I've interviewed Jay Billis and Jay Williams about how mental toughness creates success. In sports or business or anything else, the best aren't the best by accident, genetics, or good fortune. They are at the top because of a commitment to the fundamentals. True superstars never get bored with the basics, and they never underestimate their importance. My primary job is to inspire, guide, and coach people on the fundamental building blocks of high performance, both individually and organizationally. I think of my role as one who works to inspire, motivate, and instruct people in the ways of the basics. Nobody wins all of the time. Losing, failure, and obstacles are real, and there's not a sport in the world that doesn't have those ideas baked in. A game literally doesn't make sense without it. Pro athletes, even the most successful ones, lose. Sometimes constantly. Athletes are also well-versed in making mistakes. Dropping passes, missing shots, and stepping out of bounds. Even our language has adopted concepts from athletics. Think of words like fumble, strikeout, or choke. For athletes, the failure and the requisite feedback are constant. If they don't absorb and make use of that feedback, they won't be playing very long. Consequently, sports are a wonderful way to study improvement, success, and adaptation. Jerry Seinfeld once said, If you could take your experiences and ask to trade them in, the last ones I would trade in would be my failures. Those are the most valuable ones. Jerry Seinfeld is not the best in spite of those failures. He's the best because of them. And he's the best because he knows this. This work is my calling. I'm passionate about serving, impacting, influencing, and connecting with people. Experience has taught me that success is a choice, and I want to inspire and empower people and organizations to make that choice. I've turned a successful basketball performance coaching career into a professional speaking business, recognizing that the principles from the court translate to the boardroom and the office. Major companies from all over the world now hire me to teach, train, and consult on effective leadership, performance, and teamwork. And I learned all of this through sport. My time as a coach with top high school players led me to opportunities with pros. So I've seen both sides of the coin, what it takes to get there and what it takes to remain there. My last book, which many of you may be familiar with, Raise Your Game, was all about bringing your A game to your job, your relationships, and your life. But that's really only half the battle. Keeping it up, sustaining your game is even harder. The commitment to raising your game in any area of life is no easy feat. But the commitment to sustaining your game is even more challenging. An athlete has to execute on the play for the season and for a career. In business, publishing, music, acting, whatever your field, succeeding along these three timelines are equally important. The moment, the short term, the stretch, the midterm, and the long haul, the long term. Sustaining your game is about succeeding in all three, looking at the particular challenges of all three timelines. In the moment, we have to battle stress. In the stretch, we have to fight stagnation. And in the long haul, we have to beat burnout. 
Sustain Your Game is for high performers who want to learn practical strategies and actionable tools on how to sustain their game across all three timelines. It distills advice and lessons from successful athletes, entrepreneurs, social scientists, journalists, CEOs, motivational speakers, business coaches, and consultants, as well as my own personal stories and lessons. Each step along the way requires discipline. And discipline is doing what you said you would do long after the mood you said has faded. Most people refer to me as a motivational speaker, as that seems to be the agreed-upon title for someone who makes their living on stages with a microphone. But that's not what I do. I'm there to stimulate change. I'm there to encourage, empower, and guide the audience to think, feel, and act differently. To change their perspective and to change their behavior. Now, I do believe in motivation, but I never confuse it with the need for discipline. I meditate whether I'm motivated or not. I make my bed whether I'm motivated or not. I don't think I'm more motivated than anyone else out there, but I'm a lifelong proponent of discipline. I don't always want to get up early, work out, travel somewhere, but I do it because I'm disciplined. And please know my goal is not perfection. It's progress. Am I closer to where I want to be than I was yesterday? That's my only measurement. I'm most certainly not speaking from a place of mastery either. Like every one of you, I'm under construction and a work in progress. Coming off a successful first book, I understand the challenge of continuing to perform at a high level and navigating the obstacles along the way. In essence, this new book, Sustain Your Game, is a manifestation of the very thing I am writing about, a perfect marriage of author and subject, form and content. I am sustaining my game by helping you sustain yours. I can't think of a single person in my life who isn't at least partly stressed. And I'm not alone. Stress is a reality for three out of four Americans and one of the main culprits in the workplace today. Whether the stress comes from their boss, their colleagues, their own expectations, or just the rigors of the job, the feeling tends to be the same. You have too much on your plate and you can't handle it. If you feel this way, take heart. You're not alone either. We are all working longer hours and work is seeping into a larger portion of our lives. Holidays, weekends, vacations, first thing in the morning, last thing at night. An office used to be a thing you went to for a certain number of hours a day. Now work is an entire plane of existence. An office was once a place, and now it's a state of mind. Worse, we're spending more and more time there because we carry it with us. We can't pack up and leave this place behind as easily as our grandparents once left their offices. We now pack up our office itself, bring it home, into our beds and into our relationships, and at our kids' soccer games and to the bar with friends. Those in the workplace with a college degree spend 10% more time working now than they did in 1980, which was not a lax period for the workforce. The total effect of these work hours has been brutal on the individual. And it's not just what we think of as high-stress jobs like ER doctors or policemen. It's everyone's job. Two out of three American workers suffer sleep problems due to work-related stress. And this disrupted sleep ends up spiking the very stress that causes it setting us up in a cycle that's really tough to break. Of course, the workplace is only one area where stress rears its ugly head. In the 21st century, stress seems to have spread to all corners of our lives. I mean, who knew having a Wi-Fi connected smartphone in our pocket with the ability to know every fact in the world and access to everyone we ever met could have a downside? (laughs) I'm just kidding. All this stress is simply unnatural, as in literally not what nature intended. Our minds and bodies can't handle it. We once needed our stress reflexes to avoid predators out on the savanna. We evolved to survive those types of situations. Now those moments are highly unlikely, but our body still reacts as if a bison is lurking around the corner. Evolution's slow. Stress once arose out of a biological need. It was a threat response that meant life versus death. Though the modern world has gotten rid of many of these bodily threats, we're still walking around with the brains that aren't so sure. Stress is defined as a reaction to environmental changes or forces that exceed an individual's resources at that time. That's important. Stress is a response, the feeling of the world imposing itself on us. Notice I said the feeling. That's because, newsflash, the world is not actually imposing itself on us. The world is just going about doing its spinning. So stress is not about a hard reality that you're experiencing, but rather your perception of that reality. Once we accept that to be true, that stress is a response, 
then our next step is to embrace the obvious flip side of the coin. There are things we can do about it. That idea is empowering to me. I used to get stressed out by all kinds of things, being stuck in traffic, running late, right before the big game or the big presentation, and it'll lead up to a tough conversation. I was constantly on edge and rarely felt at ease. But I've worked hard over the last several years to evolve and to lower my stress response. I've conditioned myself to effectively manage that response in situations where it once spiked automatically. No longer am I being driven by the uncomfortable feeling that I can't handle what's coming. I've developed the tools to do the driving myself. I accept what is. I know what I can control and what I can't. And I've built the confidence to handle any situation thrown my way. Everyone in your life and office is expecting you to be at your best. And stress is the daily enemy that gets in your way. But what are we doing to combat it? Well, first, ask yourself this. What are you doing to invite it? See, stress is a choice. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who the hell is this guy telling me I'm choosing to have five things to do before I can leave the office? And now my boss is asking me for X and my wife needs me to do Y while my kids beg for Z. Trust me, stress has to pass through our brains first. The event is not the stress. Our reaction to the event is the stress. The events themselves are inherently neutral. They simply take on the meaning, feeling, and emotion we assign to them. If you take nothing else from what I'm saying right now, just remember that. Your mind is the ingredient that makes the stress what it is. Stress doesn't exist independently outside of us. In my first book, which I'm hoping many of you have read, Raise Your Game, I emphasize a favorite phrase of mine, control the controllables. Whether it's on the basketball court or in the office, the key is to work on your own effort and your own attitude, which is all you can really do anyway. Your day is going to be filled with things well beyond your control, but your response is 100% your choice. You may not always have control of your situation or circumstances. In fact, you rarely do, but you always have control over how you respond. Choose responses that empower you, move you forward, and improve your situation. It's that simple, but just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. It's also that hard. So stress starts inside of us and with this knowledge and understanding that we can take action against it. Be where your feet are. It's so simple, yet increasingly difficult in our modern world. We must learn from the past and plan for the future, but true presence, the here and now, is the first step to reducing stress in your life. This is becoming increasingly more challenging given the constant bombardment of distractions we face nearly every moment of every day. If I had to pick one fundamental strategy to help manage stress, it would be focus. Or another way of saying that is to live in the present moment. Even if the present moment is stressful, A, you'll be able to handle it better when you focus on it, and B, there's only so much stress one present moment can offer. Stop getting upset over events from your past and getting anxious about a future that hasn't happened yet and may not happen at all. That's time travel, and it actually increases stress. Stay where you can have an impact right now. The thing in front of you is always the most important. If that's your colleague's presentation or your child's baseball game, then that's where your focus should be. Attempting to solve A while staring at B and thinking about C is a guarantee that you'll do all three poorly. It's also the perfect recipe for unnecessary stress. Processing our past and planning our future are crucial, but neither mean a thing if you're not handling the moment. It's a balance between what you need to know and what can wait or is not worth your time. If your attention is tipping too far into the past or future, then you are failing the moment, and the moment will fail you. Spiritual guru Eckhart Tolle defines success as the desire to be somewhere and some when else. Our goal should be to get out of the past, our memory, and the future, anticipation, and stay in the now. Your body can only be in one place, so your mind and spirit need to be there too. When all three are unified, you are fully present. When we're worried about accepting something that happened or anxious about something that may happen, our stress has so much to feed on. The key, acceptance. The pain you create now is always some form of non-acceptance, uh, some form of resistance some form of unconscious resistance to what is. Be where you are because you have no other choice. This is what you're doing, so do it. 
When our energy is hovering away from the here and now, we're unsettled. That's why people who take things as they come are called grounded. They stay where they're standing. Fear comes from the past. Anxiety comes from the future. The here and now is controllable. Eckhart Tolle teaches that we should always say yes to the present moment. What could be more futile, more insane than to create inner resistance to what already is? It's not like you can successfully say no to the present moment, but when you do so or try to do so, you're inviting stress into your life. The key strategies to managing stress are really not that complicated. Now, they may be difficult, but that's because of our own habits and assumptions. Understanding the fundamentals is quite easy. And as you know, I'm a creature of the basics. If you can control it, change it. If you can't control it, let it go. Sitting in traffic is the epitome of this idea. Now, if you're like most people, it's safe to say that your blood simmers when you're stuck behind other cars and nowhere to go. This drives almost everyone crazy, and it's strange because there's not a single thing we can do about it. Yet a German study found that sitting in traffic more than triples your chances of suffering a heart attack over the following hour. Now, if stress is the feeling that your resources are overloading, this doesn't make any sense. You don't have anything to do when you sit in traffic. There are no choices to compare or decisions to make. There's not a single thing you can do about the situation. You are literally sitting still, surrounded by others sitting still. As a professional speaker who has to give each audience my full self, I live on my ability to focus. When the thoughts of what was or what will be start to accumulate on me, the stress begins. I try to shrink my window. When I'm on stage, I only have my audience and my content in my mind. I block everything else out. It's taken years of practice to reach this point of being able to be fully present on stage, but it is what allows me to be truly focused. I do between 60 and 70 paid speaking engagements a year, and I can't afford to lose focus. Many of these people are seeing me for the first and only time. The impact I have on them and the stories, lessons, and actionable strategies I share with them is really important to me. So my career depends on giving each speech as though it's the most important one of my life. I need to behave like this in an important moment for me if I want it to translate into an important moment for them. And my enthusiasm isn't automatic, but it's necessary. My focus is my lifeline. I know my material, make sure I have a connection with the audience, and keep eye contact with as many attendees as possible. Every once in a while, mistakes happen. Maybe I stumble on words or forget to make a certain point, but as long as I'm in the present moment, I can resolve it easily and stay in the flow. And the audience rarely notices. Years ago, I worked as a performance coach at the MBPA Top 100 Camp. This camp, run by former NBA players, was designed to teach the top high school prospects everything they needed to be a pro, on and off the court. My really good friend, mental skills coach Graham Betchart, addressed the athletes on his concept of playing present. Great players, he explained. Let go of the play that just happened and never worry about the play that may happen. They simply focus on what is. Focus requires practice, intention, and repetition. It's as much as a skill as dribbling or shooting. Mental strength is like physical strength and that you have to keep working at it. You don't work on your body and say, okay, now I'm in shape, I can stop. If we step away, we lose ground. If we stick with it, we get better. Well, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed and benefited from what I shared as I truly appreciated you investing your time and attention with me. If I can be of further service, please visit allensteinjr.com for info on my virtual and in-person speaking programs. Visit strongerteam.com for info on my one-on-one -on -one coaching, online course, podcast, and email newsletter called The Game Changer. And connect with me on social at allensteinjr on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. I take great pride in being accessible and responsive, so shoot me a DM on any of those platforms if I can be of service. And of course, you can search for either of my books, Raise Your Game or Sustain Your Game, on Amazon, Audible, or wherever you prefer to buy your books and audiobooks. <laughs>
and doing it in such a lovely way, a very generous way. Didn't want anything in return, which is what we hear. Selfless service. That's what we have at the heart of Personal Development Unplugged, isn't it? Striving to be our best, singing from our true voice, being aligned, congruent, showing up with our A-game and just using the fundamentals. You know, we say right at the very beginning, we like to break down all the complicated into the lovely, basic, fundamental steps. So thank you so much, Alan. I really appreciate what you've done for us. You're more than welcome to come back at any time. And yeah, please give him a great round of applause because he has done a marvellous job. And well, bigger than marvellous. So thank you so much. And I'm going to leave it like that. Just remember, please do share this episode with all your friends. That's all we have to do. If you could just share it, share the word or the name of Alan Stein. Alan Stein Jr. Did it right, Paul. So, Alan Stein Jr., please share this episode. Share with people what you've learnt. Because when you do that, you get to learn it even deeper. And choose. Really choose to create your A-game. And then strive to be just a little bit more. Because whatever you think you are, you're more than that. Have more fun than you can stand. Enjoy. It's time to fly. Warning, you are now leaving the unplugged mind of Paul Clough. It's time to fly on your own. Be brave, my friend. Personal Development Unplugged.